Hey, this is Phil Yanov with the Tech After Five podcast, and you, my friends, are in for a treat. You know, our job here is to help you advance your IT career or build your IT business, and I have got uh, my panel of regular experts, and then I've got somebody special here in a little crossover edition of the Tech After Five podcast. And of course, we have our fabulous guest who is helping folks with her brand new book, uh, career Rehab. We have Kanika Talver with us today. So first off, let me uh, introduce the panel and kind of get you situated since I think you know some of these voices. Let's start first off, uh, Carol Hamilton. Hey, Hello, Phil. Friend. Hi, everybody. Welcome, Kanika. Yeah. So excited. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. All excited. And uh, as always, am I, I mean, to the point that the guy is so regular that my kids mock me when I say, here I am next to my good friend, Scott Pfeiffer. There's Scott Pfeiffer. Good to be here, Phil. As always, it can, you know, they can say they do your part too. my kids not only do my part of the podcast, they do your part of the podcast. <laughs> and then my friends, a special uh, crossover edition, right? We, you know, we crossed the beams. We've gone from the tech after five podcast, the consultant saying things podcast. I've managed to get uh, Chris Lockhart here uh, to join yeah. us today. Chris, thanks. Hey, Phil. Here I'm glad to be here. Um, I mean, you know, this is going to be great. I'm, I've been trying to brand for you know 20 years, so I'm really looking forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the I, I Love Dirt Roads shirt is a great start, I'm thinking. I think Kanika's going to comment on that at some point. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. I have, I, have to, I have to sit up like this, though. Otherwise, it just says, I love dirt. Which... <laughs> <laughs> That's a South Carolina thing, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just that would be, be clay. clay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. See, it is red clay here. Um, but we are excited. I am so excited to have our guest with us, Kanika Talver. She is the author of Career Rehab and the architect of Rehab You. And her job is to help people rehab their careers. In addition to a regular job, I mean, it's not enough that she's got a job, but she actually is helping people get better jobs. And uh, I'm super excited. Kanika, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're, we're uh, glad that you are here. Let me tell you, I think career rehab, and again, I love the book. I think everybody ought to have it. In fact, I'm trying to figure out some way that we can work that, you know, everyone who is out there looking at their next gig probably ought to read this. It's just packed with good advice. Uh, but so I'm going to pivot right off. I want to answer the question for the folks, not naysayers, but the folks who are worried that, oh, wait a second, Kanika wrote this book before we were all remote, before we could, uh, before this COVID thing or whatever. Um, I want you to start off right off and answer the question for us at the beginning is to say, hey, um, can I still rehab my career when the world's in the place it's in right now? Um, yes, you can. This is actually the best opportunity to rehab your career. Um, there are a lot of things that are happening that are just so negative right now. But as I say in my book, this is the best time to turn your anxiety into accomplishments, to dominate your depression, right? Because there are, like, there are a lot of like emotions that we're all having right now, but this is the time to take those negative emotions and turn them into positive things. Like, you know, learning new skill sets, getting a certification, or maybe rebranding your resume or your LinkedIn profile as you, you know, try to execute your job search. And then expanding your network is, some, is a great time to do that because we're all online. We're, we're, we have nowhere to go. So we have so much more opportunity to connect with other like-minded people and experts and authors and in industry leaders. So, yeah, this is an awesome time. Yeah. No, you know what? I think you're right. My my. I think you're absolutely right. And I love the idea, turn my anxiety into accomplishments, right? Because here's the moment, I could be sitting around worrying about this, but why should I be worrying about it when I actually have time to think and write and do all that social media stuff that you're telling us to do? But I think it's right. Well, this is a good time to be out there figuring out how to do what you need to do with you. You can brand yourself. Uh, one of the things I've pointed out on these calls a bunch of times is that on Zoom, we're all just two inches tall. So, I mean, if you're, this is how you're going to meet people. We all kind of look the same in a way. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, so, uh, I want to, and I want to give these guys a chance. So, will you guys kind of give me an eye so I can understand that you want in, you want a piece of this. But um, right now, talk to me. You know, you are one of the reasons I love what you're doing is that you're in the IT space in particular. So, talk to people about you 
Kanika professionally. Where are you? What are you up to right now? Why does this matter? Um, so I've been in the IT space since um, since 2005. So I've kind of been doing this for 15 years. I'm, I primarily focus on software development, leading teams. So I'm a project manager and a scrum master. So I um, work for the federal government and I lead a lot of projects using Drupal um, for our public facing website for the federal agency that I work for. And then we use a lot of ServiceNow um, application development. So um, I've been doing this for on private sector side and I've been doing it on the federal government side. So I've been a federal government employee and I've been in private sector still working as a consultant for the federal government. So that's kind of how I um, checked myself into career rehab and rebranded myself at a particular point in my career. You know, it's in the book where I talk about how I had to make that transition from federal government to private sector. So um, yeah, I love leading teams and I love coaching teams and I kind of like use that inside of my coaching practice. So I have a lot of transfer transferable skills that I do every day within the tech space. I do that within my coaching practice you know, um, leading people to their dream tech job or, you know, just getting a, getting a new job in tech. So that's, that's kind of like what I do by day. Yeah. I'm kind of curious, um, you know, what, at what point did you decide you needed to transform, right? And, and pivot and rebrand? What was, was there like a, an aha moment, a defining moment where you're, I, I imagine you're carrying around some piece of paper somewhere and you're like, ah, oh, crap, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, and then it's like lights come on and, what was what was it for you? How did that happen? So back in about 2014-ish, um, 2013, 2014-ish, I was really unhappy in my federal government job. I had been working in an organization for five, five and a half years. I had four different managers. It was a very toxic work environment. So instead of me constantly complaining and blaming leadership and blaming my employer and blaming my environment for all the things that were not going right i decided to like start reading about personal branding and in the federal government space people don't really focus in on personal branding because they have a good comfortable like right. cushy job right they don't need a personal brand because they're going to be at this job for the next 25 to 30 years and they're really happy and comfortable that wasn't me that wasn't who I wanted to be. That wasn't what I desired to be. So I started to rebrand myself. I took the holiday season around Christmas time to redo my resume. I put my resume up on, on um, LinkedIn and on, on, on Indeed. And then a company by the name of Deloitte called me. I didn't even know who Deloitte was because I had been in the federal government space my entire career. And I was like, okay, you know, wow, look this company up. They're huge. They're, they're, they're big. They're one of the big four consulting companies. And then that's when I said I had to transform my mind from being a federal government thinker to being an innovative and to being a private sector thinker. So that's kind of what happened. And that's kind of actually, I kind of feel like I wasn't saying career rehab, but I kind of feel like that's when the career renovation for my career started back in 2014. I really like how you're bringing that in where you're talking about the different mindset between, let's say that there was this whole piece around, I was govern government and now I'm gonna go private sector. Because what I see is similar things and I'd be interested in your perspective. When someone is going up the ladder, let's say, there is a different mindset from worker to executive or team leader. There's a different mindset from entrepreneur, from employee to entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder, once you've made that decision, you've had that aha moment Chris is talking about, what's step one? So I heard resume, then what do you do? Then what's, what's another one of your wonderful tips that, that people can do building that mindset? So um, that's kind of how one of the chapters kind of came to life in the book about being a brand and not an employee, because being a federal government employee, I had an employee mindset. I went to work, I did what I was told, but I wasn't thinking outside the box. But when going to private sector, it made me to rethink about myself and say, hey, I'm a little business, I'm a little product, I'm a little service, I have some unique offerings. Yeah. So that's kind of how I came up with that chapter in the book, Be a Brand and Not an Employee. But to answer your question, the number one thing that I had to do quickly is I had to leave 
the people that was in that old environment behind mm. because they were scared. They were scared thinkers. <laughs> they were very, they, they weren't fearless. They wasn't, they looked at me and said, you're ruining your career. You're ruining your life. You want to leave your good government job to go to private sector. So the number one thing is you have to transition your mindset to think about, I need to be around people that's going in the same direction that I'm going in. I can't take everyone with me that is still stuck in that employee mindset. I need to be connected with people that look at themselves like brands. So I started to connect. I started to maximize LinkedIn because government employees, they don't use LinkedIn that much or mm -hmm. not as often as private sector people because private sector switch jobs. You know, we switch jobs a little bit right. more frequently. So what I had to do is I had to create a brand new network. I yep. love that. I love what you said right there. I mean, I think it is so hard and good on you, right? It is so hard for people to make a transition because one thing, I am leaving one group, one tribe to go to another. I decide I don't want to live here anymore. And all of your pals are going, don't leave, don't leave. No, you can't do this. This is crazy. Don't do it. And they're holding you back. I mean, they literally have a hold of your coat saying don't go, even though it's good for you. And sometimes it's family too, isn't it? Right? Yes. Sometimes you can have people who love you and think they're loving you who can't wait to stomp on that fresh little plant of an idea. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. So I had to, um, what happened is when you start to ask people for their opinions, yeah, you start to get confused. Yeah. You start to think like, you know, wow, like why... Why, why am I asking people that have only worked in one job their entire career about what I should do with my career? Like, right. why am I even doing that? So what I had to do is I had to stop. Um, I, even though my mom and my husband and all my family was happy for me, it still wasn't something that they would have done. But at the same time, I had to see, see it for myself. I had to mm -hmm. see the journey for myself. And I couldn't assume that they would understand. And I had to uh, figure out how do I connect with other people in the Deloitte network that actually um, would be of help to me because I, I mean, they love me and they care for me, but they can't right. help me with this new journey. Right. You know, one thing I love about you is not only do you have a terrific book, but you also have a lot of great YouTube content where you <laughs> You really lay out, you know, sort of how to's on how to get some things done. One of the ones I enjoyed the most that I think is especially relevant in this time was your um, how to look for a job when you want to be a remote worker. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you talk about sort of the special uh, considerations of that? If I want to be a remote worker, what, what do I need to do to look for that kind of job? And I think I filmed that video before COVID-19. I had been talking about remote interview, I mean, video interview right. and remote working like back before this became popular. So um, I always want to tell people like, I don't build my content off of the trends. I'm kind of like the trendsetter. <laughs> um, <laughs> especially at tech. We, we certainly were. We, yeah. we Thanks worked. for bringing this on us, Kanika. I mean, I didn't know who to blame. Now I got it, so. <laughs> I mean, because people always think like I'm talking about video interviews and I'm talking about remote working now because of COVID-19, but I was talking about probably two, three years ago. But um, so to, to be a remote worker or, or either to find a remote job, um, are, you, are you saying what does it take to be a good remote worker or, or, or finding a remote job? How do you find a remote job? All right. So I love this topic a lot is because in the tech space, a lot of us want to work from home and we wanted to work from home before the pandemic. Um, because we realized that we can use all these amazing technologies like Zoom and Google Hangout and, web, you know, GoToWebMeeting and all these amazing technologies and Slack to do our jobs. So um, one of the things that I think people, people they, they mess up when they're looking for a remote job is they're not maximizing different remote keywords. Hmm. They keep using remote. And then they, then, then they don't understand that companies are calling same, the same job titles that are remote telecommute or virtual. So when you, do, when you do that, you're only putting in remote project manager when you could have been putting in work from home project manager or virtual project manager or telecommute project manager. 
So when you use different types of work from home keywords in the, in the job search engines, it allows you to have a lot more results that come back to the search results. Another thing is people are not looking at companies that are 100% remote. There right. are companies that have been 100% remote before COVID-19, like WordPress, for instance, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to search for uh, remote companies and, and make that a part of your job search strategy so you can go directly to their job site, I mean, excuse me, to their website and to the job section, and you can apply the jobs directly to the companies that have been working remote um, for a very long time. We're going to see a lot more companies go 100% remote even after COVID-19 is over with because we are seeing that companies are super successful even during a pandemic and even with kids at home and, right. and all the craziness. So think about when life goes back to normal. I think so many more opportunities to work from home are going to just, just flourish for people that actually want to do that. And building on that, what I saw in one of your videos that I really appreciated is you also need to expand the, the job titles you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So while you may have in your mind one title, if you go in, and I think your, your tip was to Google some titles, right? Yeah, so, so this is another good tip in addition to Scott's question that can go together, right? So if I am trying to get a cloud job, Cloud positions are called a lot of different things at different companies. So somebody may be called a cloud engineer, a cloud consultant, a cloud architect, a solution architect. You have to Google the job titles under the category of the jobs that you're searching for. So if I'm looking for a remote cloud engineer job, I need to have a list of maybe five to 10 positions that are under that cloud computing job title umbrella, and then attach the word remote or telecommute or virtual or work, for home, work from home to those different job titles. Because if I keep, you, keep using cloud engineer, and then another company is calling um, the same job title, or same job description, cloud DevOps or cloud architect, then I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna be able to get a lot of jobs back if I keep using the same job title over and over again. So I think it's important for us to become a student of our industry and know what job titles are under that umbrella of the, of, of the things that we wanna apply to. So suppose you, you wanna become a DevOps engineer or you know, specialize in containers or something like that. Um, <laughs> but right now you have a really great job in accounting, right? <laughs> What is that? <laughs> right? Um, I think you're so, getting your answer. She's laughing. <laughs> well, I, I'm wondering because, you know, as you've pointed out, you know, I think, and I've, I've heard um, other people say, and certainly we've talked about it um, on various podcasts, now is a fantastic opportunity, right, to, to take advantage of the change, the disruption, the, all of that, right, to, to make some headway. But what if, what if your job wasn't disrupted and you're just sitting there and, and from your perception, everyone's passing you by, right, as they're changing and, and coming up with new ways to brand themselves. What, what's some recommendations for sort of that person that maybe is stuck or feels stuck uh, during this momentous time of change? You know, that's a great question. I think that it takes, one, the acknowledgement to say that you're stuck and you're trying to become unstuck because it's so easy just to stay stuck. You know, if you've been an accountant and you've been in that industry for a long period of time, you feel like, man, I can't learn anything new. I can't do a career change. I can't pivot because your, your mind is telling you to stay in a, in a familiar place. Like I say in my book, it's familiarity delays progression. If I stay in a familiar place for too long, even within tech, I'm not going to progress. Um, so I would say number one is to really, really focus in on some of these cost effective learning opportunities online. It's really no excuse right now for any of us um, to not be able to use all of these amazing programs. Google is giving out amazing programs. Um, you have Udemy. Um, you have you have just you know you have YouTube that's free. Um, I think it's important to figure out what do you want to learn and to dedicate some time to learning a new a new technology or skill set and and maybe even think about getting a certification in that. 
because it's hard to make a pivot in something that people can't see you as an expert at. Right? Yeah, like, yeah um, I, I completely agree. I, I'm, I'm wondering also, you know, you know, if let's say you're an accounting consultant at Deloitte, for example, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, how, how do you take advantage of some of those tools? How do you take advantage of the pivot without sort of disrupting your existing job, right? Because you're yeah. taking a risk by maybe doing something different. When you have this nice cushy job, you don't want to upset your employer also, right? What, what are some, some thoughts around that? I always say this, that it's important to figure out how you can maximize your training budget at your current job for your own good. Like utilize the career utilize the career situation that you have to figure out training opportunities that you can somewhat figure out if there's an opportunity for you to as an accountant to work on a project that's cloud-based, work on a project building an IT accounting system, work on a project where you are building a database system for a client. I think in in there's so many opportunities that we have to be creative in how we present it to our employer about you know doing a detail for 60 days or 90 days or 120 days um also i just think it's not the employer's responsibility to support what you want to do it's your responsibility to own where you're trying to go we place so much responsibility on the cushy job that really career ownership starts with us so if there's something else that you want to do you're not disrupting your employer by at night or in the evening studying something new maybe, so, you're, maybe you're disrupting your sleep but you're <laughs> if, if you're still performing well at work it's still a good opportunity for you to transition into learning something new the same way we would do if we went to go to the gym every day we would spend an hour at the gym why can't you spend an hour to reading, you know, reading a, a reading a tech book? I mean, yeah. why, what's, no, what's so I, wrong about that? I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, there, it is too easy, you know, and we're on a lot of calls where we see a lot of people in tech, right? And they have, it just feels like so many of them have just given up agency, right? They're <laughs> waiting for their job to take care of them into whatever's next. Or even if they're between gigs, they're waiting for their employer to take care of them in that bit without being real active. And I always love the ones who stand out. I'm just like, oh my God, when I get someone on these calls, you know, we'll do a tech after five and maybe we'll have 50 people on the call and there'll be just a handful and you can tell they are running the show. They are not letting the show run them. And I love it. That's a good point, Phil. I want to share this quick story. I was on the bench, anybody who works for for consultant companies know what the bench is. The bench means that you are, you're, you're not on a project right now. You sit on the bench, not a physical bench, but you're not working actively with a client. So when I first started at Deloitte, I was on the bench for a couple of, probably for almost two months. So I went ahead and got my Scrum Master certification on my own. I took a weekend class because the Scrum Master certification is only 16 hours. I took a Saturday and a Sunday and I went to a class in my area and I said, I wanna be a scrum master. Cause I was already kind of managing IT projects but I wasn't a certified scrum master. I didn't really put that responsibility on Deloitte. I took that responsibility to say, you know, hey, I'm on the bench. I'm gonna study something new until I get on a new project. Yeah, no, I love that. and I know Carol's got a question about branding. Let me hold up for just one second because I want to want to grab that piece that you've got right there. One of the points you make in the book is to have a plan for where you want to head, for where how much you want to commute, how much you know how much you want to make, where you want to work, what you want your geography to do. And I say that because again, a thing that we see among IT people in particular is they're kind of heggledy peggledy about deciding what that next class is they're going to take or that next certification. But there were two things that you said in the book that I thought were that were really stood out to me, right? One of which is start with what you've got, you know, understand what the assets are that you have at hand that you could apply today and make money today. And then the other is if I'm going to rehab, and by the way, you leaned into that metaphor, man, you never let it go in the book, the rehab metaphor, and it was in a house, by the way, not the other one, but in the house <laughs> metaphor, you never let go of that book. I was like, that's <laughs> commitment, friend. Um, but you know, all the way through, you've got this rehab metaphor. But the thing is, 
what's the plan? What do I want this house to look like when I'm done, or at least when it's next? Uh, that was one of those moments that I just, I loved in the book. And I think it's important to know. So you took a class knowing what you wanted to do next, I'm supposing. Yeah, so it kind of helped me a lot because I stayed at Deloitte for like a year and then I took that Scrum Master certification and I went from like 106,000 a year to 141,000 in less than a year just with that Scrum Master certification. So for me, I was like, you know, I don't, I don't want to study for the PMP. That's too crazy long and it's a really intense course. It's an intense exam. So let me get something that I can make the same amount of money with the less amount of study time and less amount of class time. And, and I can still be a good uh, tech leader for software development teams. So um, I would just say I took that downtime, you know, going back to Chris' original question, I took that downtime to not sit there and be chilling, like, oh, I'm on the bench. I'm just going to relax. Uh, I'm getting, getting paid. No, I'm like, I can get paid even more by spending time learning something new. So yeah. I love what you're doing here. And I'd actually like to build on this because what I'm hearing is I'm an efficiency networker. And I think that's a really important piece of this because I'm picturing we've got a lot of listeners who are home, maybe not listening, not looking for new jobs necessarily, but wondering what they can do to brand themselves while everybody's home. You know, mm -hmm. maybe they were getting towards that last the home stretch of the current role and they've been building on trying to make sure people know who they are and all of that. But what do they do now? Everybody's sitting home. They don't have time to go take Chris for coffee. They don't have time to go for lunch with Kanika just to keep that branding piece alive. So now what, what are your thoughts on people who don't want their lives to stop or their careers to stall just because suddenly there's this thing that's going on, which we don't know when it's going to end. Yeah, the great thing is you can, you may have a lot of time on your hands until yes. Until the bad news is I'm a bad steward of it, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> right. the great thing is like there is no really deadline to COVID nineteen. Like we don't really know, so like you you right. you you, you want to maximize possibly into January um, that right. this may still be going on. Um, the first thing is you want to create a plan. I think, you know, there's a lot of thoughts in our heads that happen. Um, I'm, I think in the book, I talk a lot about getting a journal and really sketching out what you want your life to look like. I mean, I could give you all these tips all day long. I could, I could give you all the advice, but until you journal like what Scott's life should be, what Chris's life should be, everybody's life is going to be, you know, when we create our own little blueprint and we are architects of our own little life, every room and every bits and pieces of our career may look slightly different. So I think it's important to own what you want. Um, number two, after you start to brainstorm what you want, it's time to create some actionable items of what you can do to, to get to those, to those goals, right? Because now that I know that I want to go from an accountant and to being a cloud DevOps engineer, there's going to be some work that I got to do. Career Rehab, the book was really written for those that want to do the work. Um, it really wasn't written for fluff and watered down advice. It was for those that really wanted to rebuild. That's why we have the keyword rebuild. So the rebuilding means what am I going to commit to, to doing? If I want to transition into another career or I want to get promoted, I have to figure out what skill sets do I need, what certifications that I need, and I have to make a plan to say that I'm going to dedicate an hour to two hours a day to learning something new. And adding in there maybe, who do I need to know? Yeah. Right, who can I be connecting to? And the one thing that I like going back to Phil, now that we're all two inches tall in each other's computers, there's actually a great equalizer about that, isn't there? Because now we can go into social media and speak as equals. I have a story, I could camp outside certain people's offices and never get a meeting, but I can meet them on LinkedIn at two o'clock in the morning in my fuzzy slippers and I get right in because they're there posting and now I get to comment. Do you thought things that like is, that? That is such a great, that was going to be my third advice after you, awesome. after you sketch things out, after you build your, your, your actionable items and your goals is now is to align your goals with people that have already accomplished those things. Mm. So nice. if Chris is a DevOps engineer and I, I, I really want to be one, then I'm looking on LinkedIn within my own professional network of people that have job titles that are associated with the goals that I desire to have, right? That I desire to, 
to um, accomplish because they are going to give, they figured it out. Why do I have to sit and try to figure it out? Right. So what I did, what I think you're so right um, about LinkedIn is that this is the opportunity to set up virtual zoom coffee chats and, and conversations with people. The number one thing to get people to answer is edify them, make them feel like they are the expert that their profile say that they are. And then go in with your ask. Don't just go in with your ass without making them feel good. Because people, people in this digital age, they're feeling themselves, right? You know, they're an expert. <laughs> you know, they're an expert. But you want to make sure that you that you really read their profile and you edify and you and you personalize your message with them. And then you go in there and you hook it back to something that you're trying to accomplish. And then you go in there with your ass. And I would say. 10 to 15 people send messages to because some people are not going to respond. They just don't care to respond. But 50% of those people probably will respond back if you personalize it. I think networking without strategy is a huge problem for people. They don't know how to do it with the strategy. Could agree more. Absolutely. What other uh, online networking tips do you have besides, you know, connecting with the right people and reaching out to them? What else are you doing on LinkedIn to build your personal brand uh, so that when they look at you, they see what you want them to see? Post good content and comment on good content. So it's not all about me being the authoritative, the authoritative person saying, oh, I'm just going to be like, oh, Kanika's the expert at this. I also post, I also comment on people's stuff that is very similar to the things that interest me. Because I think uh, posting good content and good consistent engagement on other people's content really allows you to show up. Because one thing I talk about in the book is that networking should not be a one way street, right? It shouldn't yep. be, I'm asking Scott, like, Scott, help me, help me, help me, help me. I should also be saying, Scott, congratulations on that new certification. Scott, that was an awesome article that you posted. I think when we, when we, when we engage into other people's content, that is a relationship building process right there. It's starting there. Um, so I think that's important too. Um, and I think another thing is people also um, feel like they have to just use LinkedIn. Find another social media network that you feel comfortable with and use that as well. Twitter is amazing because people are just being their normal, authentic selves. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that too much, but yeah, I get it. <laughs> because, because that was a politician's answer. <laughs> <laughs> people, on, people, on, people on LinkedIn are bringing their professional self to, to, the, right. to, the, to the platform. Right. I may want to see, you know, Chris says, I love dirt roads. I may want to get to know Chris on a more personalized level than I do. I like to connect with other women in tech on Twitter because we talking about <clears throat> other things that women in tech deal with within the workplace that we may can't um, talk about in a very blunt way on LinkedIn because LinkedIn people look at you funny when you be be all of you, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty say, polished, isn't it? Yeah, I would say I would say it's polished and a part of it is not authentic. I mean, right. that's, I think only the, yeah. only the Disney Phil shows up on Yeah, LinkedIn, can get right? a little shiny. Only the, Dis the Disney version of Phil shows up there. Yeah. He's all PG, yeah. So I think Link LinkedIn is great, but I think the number one thing that I've been seeing in, since this pandemic has been happening is showing up to virtual events showing mm -hmm. up to webinars, showing up to free virtual events, meet the industry experts right there. That's, 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 that's where I see the authors and the speakers and the CEOs and the CTOs that, that, that you say would never would have answered the door, would have, never, would have been in meetings in, inside the corporate office, go to their events online. Love that, love that advice. That's interesting. I mean, you know, when, when Twitter first started, um, 2008, I think I got my first account and that's where I actually met a lot of people in the enterprise architecture community within management consulting. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it transitioned to LinkedIn over time, but it didn't start there for me anyway, which I kind of think is interesting, but, um, you know, along that lines of sort of community and thought process, I, I want to get your 
you're having written a book myself, I want to get your perspective on why you chose to write the book. Uh, you know, because to your to your point, right? Um, you know, LinkedIn is sort of a polished community, right? And the book is, you know, an opportunity, the printed words, an opportunity for you to put something down on paper that's going to live sort of on a shelf forever, right? And, you know, good or bad in some cases, right? So I'm kind of curious, like what led you to think this is a great idea, this is the way I'm going to help increase my brand awareness is by writing a book about branding. That's a good question, Chris. Um, I believe that even as professionals, we are, we, 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 we work for companies and we, we, we build products and services. Why can't we build our own products and services? You know, I, I can work for um, a big tech company and I can help them build their digital products or we offer certain consulting services. This book is a product and it's, it's something that, well, to be honest with you, I wrote the book because they say when you write a book, you stay booked. <laughs> um, it's really, also your second book too, isn't it? Yeah. This is my. This is my. This is. I have a traditional pub, publishing deal with Entrepreneur, but I have a self-publishing yeah. book that I did the first time around. But I really wrote the book because um, I really wanted something that I didn't really feel like there was something on the market that really touched on the things that I touched on. There was a lot of great career coaches and authors writing about how to create a great LinkedIn profile, how to do a great resume, um, how to um, you know, professionally network. But there wasn't something that was telling people to take back career ownership. Like <clears throat> the rebuilding is your responsibility. And I think that we keep in college, you know, with those that like me went through traditional education with the college and got a job, we made it all about the employer being loyal to us. I wrote this book because I felt like I wanted to teach professionals that you got to be loyal to yourself and you have to invest in yourself. So I wrote the book for paid speaking engagements, to be honest with you. I had, you know, I was supposed to be speaking at Intel before COVID happened. I wrote the book so I could continually build my brand with a podcast show and a TV show. To answer your question, the book is going to turn into online courses. The book is just the beginning of many more products and services that's going to come up under the career rehab business. Um, I love it. It's an ecosystem of self-reinforcing products. That's great. Yeah. And I kind of, I was a big geek of self-help books. So like I would read all the self-help books by John Maxwell, 10X, 4-Hour Work Week. You know, and then I was like, man, like, I want my book to feel the same way people feel about those authors. I wanted the content to be, I feel like I gave away too much information in the book, in the first book, to be honest with you. But there is a second book inside of me. The third book, I should say third book, technically third yeah. book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you for that. See, this is an awesome conversation. There's one more thing, and I'm going to, with your permission, I wonder if we could go there for a moment. I, I think you've got a unique opportunity to be a voice about diversity in the IT space. And we've done podcasts where we've talked about how do we get more women in IT. Um, you're bringing a unique voice to this space. And if it's okay for us to figure out, ask you, how can we be allies for the process to have more faces like yours in IT? I, I was hoping that you'd talk to us about that. Sure. Um, you know, being a black woman in tech is, for the last 15 years, it has had its, challenge, its challenges. Um, one thing that I think that I really want you guys to help us with is to understand that the talent exists. Um, don't believe the hype that there are not many black people or minorities that are hungry to be in tech. There are a lot of them right on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I think it's important to um, build a community and, a, and, and, and build alliances with organizations that promote um, women in tech and minorities in tech. I think it's a siloed approach right now because I'm a part of a lot of blacks and I'm just going to use it as an example. I'm a part of a lot of blacks in tech organizations, right? But I don't see, you know, you guys being a part of the solution with us. We can 
continue to ch you know be champions for our own race but until we could continue to come together and continue to work together um, on on bringing more um, minorities into the tech space and more you know women it's not going to work it's kind of like women you have women in tech groups you have blacks in tech groups yep. then you have another group of just the big for fortune 500 companies that um quote unquote say that they want to be a part of the solution but they're not a part of the committees they're not a part of the advisory boards they're not a part of the conversations we keep having our own events and we want you guys to come and be a part of those conversations and when you guys are in the in the space of hiring um and recruiting it's, it'll be great if you guys can fairly recruit. Um, diversity inclusion, it starts with like, you know, um, looking for amazing profiles like myself that are in that, that have brown faces and say, hey, let's, let's reach out to them instead of just like continually reach out to the same types of profiles of people. So, um, I mean, that's really all that I have to say say about that but i'm really open to hear you guys questions about you know what else you think we could do together to to help this this situation so can we yeah. go on linkedin and see who you're following and who you're affiliated with to find those groups so that we can become members and start tracking their scheduling and find out where those events are whether we're rehiring and recruiting i know all of us are in different segments of of the marketplace at this point but this is a this is a true heart project for me and i I want walking papers. I want to go beyond this conversation because you've really lit that up for me. Now, what do I do? Do I go on to your LinkedIn to see some of those connections? Um, the first thing you can do is definitely um, go onto my LinkedIn profile. But then in addition to that, I could email you guys a list of these organizations and their websites and their LinkedIn professional groups. Um, I, I think that um, we as minorities, um, we can't, fight this alone. I think right. and you shouldn't have to. These organizations were established and they were built with the intent of, of, of us fight, fighting this fight alone. I don't think that that, that approach is going to work anymore. Um, I think another 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 to answer your question, Carol, another thing is to focus in on finding the, the directory of HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, and tapping into their STEM um, departments, their engineering departments, their computer science departments, and looking for um, recent graduates that are coming out from those schools. That's something that's just really directly on the internet that you guys can find. Yep. But I went to a historically black college um, and they have amazing computer science and engineering and science programs. And we just don't always see um, the best companies, you know, we all have this dream of working for Google or Facebook and Twitter, but they don't always come to the universities. And I always tell my clients, um, don't always focus on the big companies. Focus right. on the companies that really, really want you there. I'm with you. Because once you get there, you want to be treated with respect and, in and inclusion, not just having somebody check a box because now they've met quota. Totally with you there. Yep, we've got it. It's got to be more than that to be me. got it more than that because yeah, it was in my twenties. It once was a dream of mine to, to to work for those companies, but then after some of my friends went out to California and they told me their experience, and then you know even in my CNN article while Google should hire me and the numbers still did never increase since 2014, it's a heart condition. You either want diversity inclusion right. or you don't. Like, yep. it's, not, it's not something to do because we're checking the box. So I, I would say, if there's a small company or a medium-sized company that minorities can work at, I want them to be there because they want to feel included and they want to feel like my, my, my expertise and knowledge, I'm not here because of the color of my skin. I'm yes. here because I add value. Yes, yeah. totally with you. Wow. Kanika Talver, thank you so much for the gift of all your time today. I think you've got a unique voice, and I really think that if anybody has found themselves in the spot where they want to do what comes next in their career, I don't think we've even touched on much of what's in that book, and people ought to be going out and buying your book, because I thought it was just a great read. Um, tell folks where else they should go to look to find you, other than running out to Amazon and buying your book. 
So you guys can find me. All of my social media handles are at Kanika Tover. Um, so you guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, or YouTube. <laughs> I'm on all of them. So, yeah. uh, um, you know, I, I want to get better at posting more YouTube videos because I kind of slacked off since COVID-19. But I feel like there's enough on there for people to get value. You can also find me if you want to get more information about my career coaching practice and my other services, kanikatover.com is my website. Yeah. You see, you see the branding is so consistent. It's all it's Kanika, beautiful. Yeah. Over. <laughs> um, I mean, we're lucky, those of us who are born with a statistically improbable name. You know, there's just not a whole bunch of people with the same name, right? So it's like, oh, yeah. you can find me, right? If you go look for Kanika Tolver, there's only one of those, perhaps, but we're a small number. Show yeah. offs. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Yeah, I've got uh, I've got a friend who with a name that's got he's in my there are three different people with exactly the same name in my address book, right? But they're three different people with the same name that I've met over the years. But Kanika, yes. thank you so much. By the way, this is again this is just great. I'm gonna go around and just say thank you to all of our hosts here, so that they can also say thank you to do. Let me uh, in deference start with Carol Hamilton. Uh, Kanika, that was fantastic. And her book again is Career Rehab. And I'm, I'm already a huge fan and expect to be watching her career and seeing her on all the talk shows when they start taping again. Um, should you have finished her book and now want to say hi to me, you can find me on LinkedIn at Carol Hamilton Live. Thanks, Phil. Beautifully done. Uh, Scott Pfeiffer. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Kanika. That was fantastic. I think you gave our listeners a lot of great actionable advice. And uh, I'm going to be buying your book and sending it to both of my kids. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Phil, Carol, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, our special, special guest host, Chris Lockhart in the crossover edition, Crisis on Infinite Podcasts. We've got the crossover <laughs> podcast with consultants saying things host. Chris Lockhart. Yeah, it's like, it's like four dimensions. It's like a tesseract or something like yeah. that. It's a, a cast within a podcast or yeah. something like that. Anyway, uh, no, uh, this was awesome because I think you know so many uh, people that I've known in my career in large consulting firms or small ones for that matter um, are faced with this question, right? Which is, you know, how do I continue to advance um, and how do I pivot and how do I make myself known for something? And, and how do I go about doing that? So I think this is great. I'm also ordering the book. Um, I don't have anyone to send it to, but maybe I'll order two copies and I'll send somebody a copy. And we'll go from there. But I, I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Phil, for having us on. Yeah, so glad that you were here. Uh, again, thank you, Kanika. Thank you to my hosts. Uh, I'm Phil Yanov. And the best way to see us is to come to one of our Tech After Five virtual events. You just heard the experts say that you should still be networking in this time and you should be going to virtual events. So go buy her book because I want you to be smarter and better at networking when you come to my events, right? And you can find me at techafter5.com. I get us to Kanika. Look at this. Grab that quick career rehab book. I really did love this book. I think you're going to love it too. If you have any reason at all to be wanting doing something else with your career, you should go buy the book and then come practice everything she taught you at Tech After Five. Thank you. Friend.